really about um, helping to build this ecosystem when we talked about an ecosystem uh, a bit in the introduction. So, uh, you know, five years ago, probably when you say impact investment and social enterprise, people are still going to give you like a very questioning look. Um, and, you know, at that time, we really want to be able to sort of like grow this uh, impact sector in Indonesia. So we, our main activities is really the four benefit microfinance and the impact investment. And these are sort of like the SDGs uh, that we are trying to support while we're doing it. And, you know, I, want, I just want to highlight the partnership for the goals, especially for this particular session, is that I don't think we can achieve what we want to achieve if we only do it together, uh, if we only do it by ourselves. We really need to be doing this, all of this together uh, and partner with, you know, like-minded organizations uh, that might have a different expertise than uh, we have to actually create the impact that we want to create. Um, and so the so basically two things we do, we really want to end poverty and reduce inequality, but how we do it, we do it via education. But then for the bottom of the pyramid, education is not, um, it's not attainable without you economically empowering the family because it's not only about free classes or free education. It's about the nutrition that will enable the kids to actually learn. It's about providing transportation costs for them to actually go to family too. Uh, so next slide. So this is our four benefit microfinance. We've run this for uh, 10 years plus now. Uh, we started from a cooperation. Right now, we're a uh, ventures. So right now, we're registered in the FSA of Indonesia. We have around uh, 47,000 clients. Uh, but, um, you know, those clients are really the bottom, bottom of the pyramid. Uh, our um, av typical average loan size is probably 150 Singapore dollars. Um, there, your mom and pops, the food sellers, the um, the the really the hard workers of the family and we uh our aim is really to bring them from two dollars to actually the six dollars so you know somewhere that they can jump so then they can actually become what it's called the aspiring middle class um we really try to focus on providing benefit not just the capital so what we do is we try to um, introduce them to savings habit as well uh, and also for all of our long-term clients, we provide them with uh, opportunity to get scholarship and obviously better nutrition and family welfare as well. Uh, and we do our impact measurement quite uh, rigorously on an annual basis. So lastly, on the impact investment, this is actually the latest uh, addition to what we do. Uh, if you can move on to the next slide, yeah. So re th really, this is actually to, again, support um, support this, the social enterprise ecosystem here. We, you know, our deal size is really between 50 to 150. It's, we're trying to be the impact first impact investors, uh, fill in the gap uh, of the market uh, and making sure that this uh, social entrepreneurs have some room to, uh, you know, test out their products, really find the product fit in the market. So then they can be true to the impact that they want to create. Um, I think that's all for me and YCAP. I hope uh, it somehow uh, provide the, the description and explanation about YCAP and hopefully, you know, friends in Indonesia can also uh, reach out to us if they need anything, we'll be happy to help. Great, thank you, Stella. And I love that you guys have invested into chocolate. Um, I see that brand all the time, I think, when we go through Bali and I'm um, in Indonesia. Um, thank you. So um, please, if you're dialing in from Indonesia, please spread the word, uh, especially if you're, you know, I mean, Indonesia is huge. Um, and so if you can just pass the word along about YCAB and if that can help someone, it'd be just amazing. So thank oh, you. Yeah, and also when um, we're very happy that actually Alex and Mason came up to us and, kind of, oh, and Pastor Melvin too and say, hey, do you want to partner with us for this resilience fund and try to actually help more social enterprises? to survive this and thrive uh, through the pandemic. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to actually helping more through that fund. Yeah, 
So there is a, yeah, there's a collaboration happening here between YCAB and RTVN's resilience program. And so maybe also I'll just mention that today we really want to be um, talking about solutions. Uh, we want to say, we want to bring the help because we all know the, the issues that are out there. So um, we really hope that for the people darling, you know, this will be like a glimmer of hope and also just a, a more awareness of what's out there in terms of funding. Um, so maybe I'll throw it over to Ted now. I know we had some questions yesterday about who are your funders uh, for your, for your fun uh, how do they what do they earn and um, any grace period and uh, minimum installments and how does it operate thank you very much so um, just to give a little context for the last three and a half three years now beneficial returns has been making loans to social enterprises addressing poverty in Southeast Asia and Latin America um, on our website you can see the names of all of our investors they are uh, family foundations, donor advised funds, and faith-based communities, um, all in the US at the moment. And our investors earn a 2% return uh, per year. They're paid principal and interest every six months over a seven year period. And thus far, we've returned over 350,000 US to our investors. Um, uh, seven weeks ago, we launched uh, the trust fund to uh, respond to COVID-19. And this is an emergency loan fund for social enterprises anywhere in the world that are graduates of an accelerator, at a uh, GSBI accelerator at Miller Center at Santa Clara University. And uh, in this situation, uh, the offer to our investors is, is quite a bit different. So just to back up with beneficial returns, our borrowers borrow, borrow between 50,000 US and 500,000 US. Uh, they have loans that last as long as five years and we expect them to pay us principal and interest every month. There's no grace period. Uh, these are fully amortizing loans. Uh, in the situation of the trust fund, uh, these are uh, unsecured high risk loans that we're making very quickly anywhere in the world. And for this fund, we also attracted uh, philanthropic investors, but with a very different proposition for them. Uh, our investors uh, uh, have participated via a recoverable grant, and uh, they will pay a 2% management fee every year for the next three years. And at the end of the three-year period, they will receive all of their capital back, less the management fee, and less their pro rata share of any losses that we incur. And so, whereas with beneficial returns, uh, we're doing our best to make loans to social enterprises that we feel confident can repay their loans. With the trust fund, we have a different set of criteria and we're making loans to social enterprises that we think have deep impact and our goal is to keep them alive. And so, um, our investors can expect to recover somewhere between 94% of their money and 0% of their money. I suspect the figure will be much closer to 94%, uh, but I think uh, the fact that they're participating via a grant uh, is, is valuable because it puts front and center the fact, uh, as I mentioned just yesterday, that when investors make, um, when uh, philanthropists make a grant, they earn a negative 100% return immediately. And so the trust fund, uh, with the trust fund, they, they will earn more than they would with a grant, uh, but certainly less than they would expect making an investment in normal times. These aren't normal times. Uh, all of our borrowers for the trust fund are offered a six month grace period, and then they repay interest at a 2% rate. So we're recognizing that they're in serious financial constraints right now. And so we're providing them appropriate uh, financing that matches the situation that they're in. Great, thank you. So I'm guessing that whole spiel, that's how you got them to give is basically, if you were to give this money away as uh, philanthropic or charity money, you wouldn't get it back anyway. But this year you have a very slight chance to get it back. That's, that's right. And it's all about expectations, right? We, we aim to always meet the expectations of our investors. And we also aim to set expectations for our investors. And uh, too often in this industry, investors begin by, impact investors begin by sharing what they need. 
you know what, I need a 7% return. I need liquidity. I need low risk. I need diversification. And I believe that that's fundamentally the wrong question for impact investors to ask. The right question to ask is what does the world need? Because frankly, impact investors don't need any of those things, right? They're already blessed to be wealthy uh, and or to be using small amounts of money if they're not. And the right way to approach this work is to ask what's needed uh, in the world and to put your needs last. Wow, thanks, Ted. Very, very, um, I love your wisdom and just your perspective on this. Thank you for that. Um, Alex, so do you mind just diving into a little bit of the nitty gritty of how the resilience program works? Sure, good morning. I think as a founding premise, I just wanna state up front that I get very wary when we talk about support, when we talk about impact investing, when we talk about moving forward in faith, that is not accompanied by concrete actions, by giving. And in this regard, TBN recognizes the hurdles to, to impact investors, especially in this region, and certainly the need for leadership to catalyze and to encourage other potential funders to come alongside. So we propose to do this via this idea of sacrificial capital, of catalytic capital, call it what you like, by taking first loss in this resilience fund that, that we're setting up. And we're really glad because TBN is not the only one who's put up their hands to want to do this. Uh, like Stella mentioned earlier, you know, in Indonesia, the, the, the working theory is we're partnering with the YCAP Foundation and YCAP Ventures will be an investor in the fund as well. And between TBN and YCAP Foundation, you know, we'll take up to 20% of first losses. And in, in Malaysia, these are the two countries where we'll have the fund. Uh, TBN is also going to take up to 20% of, of first losses. And uh, our strategic partner there would be Magic. Um, you heard from Zulera some days ago. And they are actually willing to come through as an equity investor. So cushioning these, these debt investors to, you know, to, a, to a fair extent. So the, the way it's shaping up at the moment, in Malaysia, we're trying to raise 500,000 ringgit for the Resilience Fund, um, but they, they've got a scheme. My Malaysia Co-Investment Fund, you know, MySIF for short, that will match any magic accredited uh, social enterprise one for one, except they'll do it interest-free. So right away, we get to double our, our fund size. And on top of that, magic is going to come through. Um, and this is the proposal for them to then come through with another 500 grand, uh, making it a one and a half million ringgit um, fund. And we know in the, in the scheme of things, that's still not a significant amount of money, but our whole working premise also is that we, we do want to focus on the few in Indonesia and in Malaysia. Indonesia, the proposed size of the fund is uh, IDR 5 billion. And again, if you've got in investors listening in, I mean, it's an eclectic scene for social enterprises in Indonesia and, and they need it, right? As a country, they really need it. They need these connecting points between communities and these value chains to really for, for these people to stand a chance. So we've um, got about 20% of first losses there as well. Uh, what first loss really means is TBN and its partner will be the first to take the hit well before any other lender is affected. And so, as, as you can imagine, this changes the economics behind capital preservation, you know, which is front and center on, on many lenders' uh, minds you know, considerably. Um, the way we intend to make these loans would, would largely be through a P2P platform. And the reason we want to do that is, and this would be on the, on the private side of it. So these deals will never be made known to public um, apart from the, the people, the pool of investors that we have identified. And the reason we want to go through a platform is because we, want, we like the rigor of the credit assessment. And this is something we recognize uh, within TBN as an area of improvement for ourselves. You know, we really like to build this solid uh, vigor 
not, it's not to say we will not override some of the flags that are, are thrown up, but we just rather go in with prior knowledge rather than to be caught off guard. Um, in terms of eligibility, we're looking for post-revenue companies. Uh, in fact, two years, you, you need to be post-revenue for at least two years. And um, similar to the trust fund, we'll, we'll be granting a six month moratorium where no, no repayment would be expected of you. But beyond that, we, we would expect an amortizing loan, um, a principal plus interest. I think the idea behind that is we really want to couple this, this warmth, this support with firmness. And I, I, we really believe that it is within that framework of warmth and firmness that enterprises grow best. You know, not, I'm a homeschooling dad, as you know, it's, it's very similar there with, uh, with parenthood. In terms of interest rates, um, we expect funds made out of the resilience fund to offer significant discounts to what you'll be able to get in a market, you know, as an indication in Malaysia, I think that funding rate for SMEs is largely between 12 and 14%. And if you've got, if you're selling to, to big buyers and the government and all that, you can get a discount, but you know, the floor of that will still be something like 7%. So we are looking for an effective interest rate between three and 5% in Malaysia and between 8 and 10% in Indonesia, which is still uh, well below. And the thinking behind these rates as well is we do expect these social enterprises to be growing at rates uh, a, lot, a lot higher than, than those rates that I've just cited. You know, certainly as, as COVID begins to, to abate, you know, the pressure's there. So we expect the enterprises to well be able to, to afford that. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop right here. Cool. Thank you, Alex. I hope that's enough detail for those who just wanted to find out more about the resilience program. Um, but we will flash out later um, just uh, Alex's email to get in touch, whether you're an SE yourself looking for funding or whether you are an investor or just someone who wants to give uh, and just help. Um, I think sometimes people even are scared of the word, you know, I'm not an impact investor, but no, like, I think we all can do our part. And I just love the story about the collaboration that's happening. Um, so please put the word out. Um, we, we are looking for more organizations and partners. Um, and I mean, crazy dream, you know, if we could have this, not just in Indonesia and Malaysia and other places, please come and get in touch. Cause for those places, um, the, the best we can do um, in other Southeast Asian countries is to match make. Uh, so if we hear of a, a funder and um, they have a heart for a certain country or certain cause, that's what we can do. Um, now, what I want to do is throw um, the time over to Jen now. So yesterday, um, we were t you were talking about how um, the investments that you make as an impact investor through uh, Citroen Capital is... Uh, in the healthcare sector and in education. And you, you, you chose that because you actually spent the time doing research and analysis on the needs of Malaysia. And that's where you uh, chose to uh, zone into. Um, I think Stella mentioned uh, in our brief um, uh, after session kind of wrap up that she was just really impressed at the approach that you took. And it is very impressive. But I just want to find out more, uh, apart from the industry focus, what else do you look for um, when you make an investment? So pre-revenue, like what stage um, and all of that. Yes, yeah. so if you can just expand a little bit more. Thanks, Wen. Morning. Um, so basically, we generally invest about 100 to 500k Malaysian ringgit in early stage startups with some sort of traction um, within the education and healthcare industry, as you've just mentioned. We usually do this um, through equity and convertible notes. So um, in a more bigger picture sense, we adopt a portfolio approach where we score the different startups according to three main dimensions, the risk, the returns, as well as the impact. So impact such as, um, is the social innovation relevant to what's needed by the community or is there potential for impact growth in the future? Um, returns might be the typical growth rate, the market opportunity. Risk is also the typical compliance risk, executions risk and stuff like that. So aggregating the three dimensions together, we want to achieve um, maximization of financial returns as well as impact. We actually have a quite intensive internal scoring system to rate these startups accordingly. But to keep it simple, 
because we invest in the earliest stages, um, pre-seed and seed, and offer some sort of non-financial support alongside our financial support. So then the team is perhaps the most important criteria. So not only the founders, but also the founder teams themselves. So we look for the intention and the passion to make impact. Um, we also look for dedication and commitment, um, competency and expertise. Uh, we also do pay particular attention to tech startups because we think it is a competitive advantage uh, in today's world. So generally, if you were to think about it, we invest exactly like a typical venture capitalist. But it's just that we have impact embedded within our processes all the way from selection, due diligence to capacity building at the end of it when we invest in them. So that's how we generally um, evaluate a company uh, in terms of how we want to invest in them and what sort of values we can bring to them once we have invested in them. Yep. Right. Thank you for that. Um, and yesterday there was a question, I think, for Ted as well, just on that, like, you know, what do you actually look for? And I know that the trust fund, uh, the one that you guys set up just to address, um, you know, uh, SEs who are affected by the pandemic, um, you have a credit assessment. Um, so if you wouldn't mind talking us through this, Ted, and we actually have a slide as well so that people can see uh, the different criteria. So um, David, can you just flash this up as well, please? Of course. Thank you, Wen. So uh, at the Trust Fund, we have a, an 11 member volunteer credit committee uh, uh, composed of people from all over the world, most of whom do not have a financial background. Uh, we were very committed to attracting several social entrepreneurs to join our credit committee because we believe that they provide a very valuable perspective that's often lacking from impact investors. Uh, so how do we then corral 11 people uh, that have never met each other in person that have just committed uh, in the last few weeks to join a credit committee to all make decisions based on the same framework? It's, it's not a simple task. So we devised uh, five, uh, five uh, a framework that has five components. And we ask all, all of our credit committee members to evaluate uh, the applicants based on these five criteria. Uh, first and foremost, there's a reason why it's number one. We only want to finance organizations that already have achieved substantial impact and have the potential to continue to do that if they can survive the COVID crisis. And so it doesn't matter how strong your financials are. Uh, if you can't show us big impact, uh, we won't approve you for a loan. Um, you can read, uh, I'm sure everyone on the call is literate, so I won't read through this. But uh, the other big one is, of course, we're looking for financial uh, sustainability. So uh, profitability is not uh, a metric that we consider. Uh, we wouldn't consider a very profitable social enterprise as being more deserving than one that is less so, but we want to see a financial model that works. And so we are limiting ourselves to organizations that had some level of financial stability before the crisis. Uh, and so th these are the criteria that we use. Fundamentally, our evaluation after impact is not vastly different than what a bank would, would do. So we're reading balance sheets, we're evaluating management, we're looking at competition, we're understanding how uh, the pandemic is affecting the business, uh, we're looking at country risk, uh, we're doing many of the same work that a bank would do, but throughout this, uh, just as uh, John said, is a focus on impact as well. Great, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I thought it was really helpful just to have the slide up so people can kind of read through it. Um, I guess if you, as uh, someone sitting out there and you're like, okay, I want to do this on my own, uh, which I would, yeah, you know, go ahead, you're very brave, but this slide might actually help you, um, yeah, just to kind of see how the other funds and um, other uh, seasoned impact investors are doing this. So maybe can I throw it to Stella? Uh, I know you briefly talked about it before, just on YCAB um, and your investments. Um, what, what do you look for? Uh, and kind of what are the criteria? Um, I think very, uh, it's quite on the similar notes as what Jan and Ted also uh, have shared. And um, without you know, reiterating what they have actually shared, uh, probably two things that uh, really 
being prioritized uh, at YCAP when we look at uh, the the potential investee that we have is uh, the management or founders. Um, I think uh, that's a quite important aspect for us. Um, with the ventures that we are trying to um, support, they typically still on the very early stage versus the mature post-revenue. So the commitment and the capability of the management or the founders that is implementing um, um, the business uh, makes a big difference uh, whether we want to support him or her. Um, and also why I said uh, that is important because then it relates to the second part is the impact. Uh, so we try to invest in companies where we actually know the industry well, for, for example, the education sector, the, you know, part of the economic empowerment or um, welfare creation, because we sort of know what is missing within the supply chain and how this particular social enterprise can actually uh, solve the problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the rest is the same. We will look at, you know, their forecast, we will look at what they want to do within the first three months, the first uh, one year, uh, how do they think about cash management. Um, so the, the same thing that, uh, you know, as Ted mentioned, the same financial due diligence will still happen. Um, the same sensitivity analysis will still happen, but then the first two probably, um, you know, make a huge uh, role uh, when we uh, analyze potential investments. Great, thank you. Um, well, I just want to touch on that comment that you made about um, getting to know the founders. So can I just find out, like, what's the process? Like, so, I mean, is it like you spend about two months, you really get to know them? Um, how do you go about um, establishing that relationship and seeing whether there, yeah, whether there is synergy in working? And I'm going to throw this out to Jen and everybody else in the room, because I think you, we do hear that a lot. It's about the management and the, the founders. Um, I'm just intrigued to hear, um, Stella. Um, yeah, I think it's a part uh, science and part art as well. Um, well, we, I mean, why can ventures work in only one country? So we do have that, um, you know, uh, and we're Indonesian. So we do have that network that we can ask references for. Um, and, but, you know, when you say how much time we spent with a, with a social entrepreneur, um, it's a trade-off between wanting to make the investment that at the right timing or, you know, delaying the investment, um, to later, uh, so we uh, we combine it with you know reference check to the market. We see uh, we ask for their uh, you know resume history. Um, we do a, a, a fair bit of really like deep dive interview with the management. Not only like what are their passion um, on top of what they're doing and how what made them to become social entrepreneur. Because as Ted mentioned yesterday. It's social entrepreneurs are the one that see a storm and you know go right through the storm and try to survive through the storm and then hopefully come out from the storm alive. Um, not a lot of people can actually you know survive, and some people would want to quit midway. And we we definitely don't want to support those kind of uh, social entrepreneurs. Great, thank you. Uh, Jen, I know you've made a couple of investments. How, how was the process like for you? Um, I guess more or less similar to Stella. Um, but to add on to that, it's also more of a, a personal touch and a mutual relationship. A lot of them, they, they might be like, oh, wow, impact investors have got money. We might have to listen to their guidance and advice whenever they give it. But for me, also because... I myself is also starting up my own impact fund, so to say. So then I would like the relationship to be a lot more on par. You learn from me, I learn from you. I know this impact tactics, why don't you incorporate it? Or I know this financial bits, why don't you also um, consider it when you're doing your accounting, whatnot. So um, the relationship is a bit mutual. So not only we pick them, to me, not only we pick our investor, uh, investee portfolio companies, I think they should pick us as well they should consider what value add that we can contribute towards their startup, what sort of a network we can bring to them to, in order to grow their businesses. So it's a, 
yeah, I generally just do believe in a mutual relationship between investor and investee companies. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, I want to go to the veteran in the room um, who's done this for a long time, Ted. Maybe, maybe share a war story, maybe even, about this whole area. Well, I have no shortage of war stories, but um, we have a tendency to lend to people um, where I've had dinner at their home or they've had dinner at my home or both. And so um, it does, add, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that uh, the name of, of Alex's fund is the Resilience Fund because that is truly what we're working for. I have very little visibility into the future, but one thing I know is it will be very challenging. Uh, and I would have said that five months ago as well before, before the pandemic. And so we too are looking for people that are completely committed to this work. And I will let you in on a little secret. Lending to social entrepreneurs in many ways is, uh, is less risky than lending to conventional business people. Uh, most business people, uh, they, they'll try an industry and if things don't pan out, They'll, they'll quit and they'll get a job or they'll move to another industry and try again. Social entrepreneurs, this is their life calling. They are completely committed to this to the point that they are often irrational. And that is exactly what I like to see. When I make a loan, we've put our money in the trust of a social entrepreneur and I want them not to give up and I want them to continue, even when it becomes irrational, to push away and to try to succeed and that, that is exactly um, the type of spirit that we're looking for. And I think that we're very fortunate that we see that um, throughout the world with social entrepreneurs. But I can tell you many stories of, of businesses that had to, uh, had to pivot and change and adjust what they are doing, uh, leave countries because of government restrictions and set up shop in other countries, uh, challenged by closed ports, challenged by uh, currency devaluation. And so in many ways, the people most trained to operate it with COVID-19 are social entrepreneurs. This is you know, yet another challenge that they're facing, but they are inherently scrappy, gritty people that if anyone can survive, they're the ones that are most likely to do it with very few resources. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Ted. Um, I'm going to stay on the topic of founders. Um, have you seen a difference between those founders and, and the enterprise that have gone through some kind of capacity building program, uh, an accelerator, um, versus those who haven't? And um, do you have a bias in that uh, is one of the criteria that you have to go through a certain program? Um, I'm going to throw it to the floor. Um, Alex, looks like you're unmuted. Do you want to say, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah, actually, that's one of the conditions that I left out earlier when I was describing the resilience fund. I think what was interesting to me, if I could just cite a slight allegory from my time working at the bank, was that we couldn't help but notice that the most prolific uh, contributors to the business were invariably um, people that we had hired first as interns and mentored as analysts, you know, through years and by about year, end of year two, year three, you know, they really start to hit this accelerating um, part of, of, of their curve, of their development curve, and they end up just being very, very good. And I, I couldn't help but notice. And on the other side, whenever we try to hire externally, experienced hires at quite a senior level, most of those hires tended to be flops. So I think it's, it's this whole thing going back to what we were talking about yesterday, that because these social enterprises are by and large very nascent and very young still, the biggest decision we've got to make are still people decisions. We're backing people, we're backing their resilience, we're backing their grit, their ingenuity, their creativity. Um, so just having an accelerator and a capacity building program, yes, it it adds value to them as individuals, but it also allows us to, to know what they're like under pressure, to know what they're like. It, it gives us that benefit of, of time uh, in journeying together. And it, 
it forms, I mean, it informs us about the quirks and, and the strengths and the areas of uh, improvement, you know, as an individual, as an, as an enterprise. So it's something that personally I, I prize very highly. And I know yesterday evening, a lot was said about the Seth, uh, about Seth. And um, I'm just thrilled that TBN as an ecosystem builder is able to have that as one of the pillars. Thank you. Uh, Ted? Yes, so I, I took some notes. Uh, we, we exclusively lend money to uh, social enterprises that are graduates of a handful of accelerators or ones that have been recognized by a few international organizations. Uh, amongst our borrowers, we have four Ashoka Fellows. Uh, we have uh, uh, folks recognized by the World Economic Forum, by Ashton Awards, by the GSBI Accelerator. We have three Endeavor companies a Google Impact Award winner, a challenge winner. And uh, so we are working exclusively with social enterprises that have received support. And that accomplishes two things for us, uh, because there's there are far too many social enterprises for us to consider all of them. Uh, one, I believe that the names that I mentioned and a handful of others are very good at selecting uh, uh, high quality social enterprises. So they narrow the, the funnel just by day one into the ones that they ad admit into their programs or give an award to. And then afterwards, they provide very valuable training and introductions that make it more likely that those entrepreneurs will be successful. And many of these are, are also, I consider, a stamp on the integrity of the individuals involved. And so I like, you know, some people say that we're, um, we're piggybacking. I would like to say that we are joining the hard work and, and, the, and the staff and the offices and the budgets of the names of all the organizations that I said, but we're coming in afterwards to provide financing so that those social entrepreneurs can grow. Great, thank you. Uh, Jen, oh, Stella, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think this goes back to the importance of partnership that I mentioned earlier, uh, that YCAB values uh, highly of uh, because again the impact that needs to be created is so big and especially with this pandemic it becomes even greater and we really cannot achieve it alone um, I mean YCAP uh, up to now still don't have any external later so but we do work with ones that uh, in the market uh, we always ask them for you know potential pipelines or even we work with other um, impact investors as well that uh, might might be uh, might have larger check size probably than us, but then they see potential social um, enterprises that have come to their door and they think that it's actually quite promising, but still not at the size that they would invest to. Um, so you know any mentorship and any accelerators program, I think it's very uh, valuable for any enterprise to go through because the mentorship the knowledge given, you know, or just the experience uh, is, is going to be very valuable for, you know, for any entrepreneurs. Great, thank you. Uh, Jen? Oh, no, I basically agree with what they said. But generally, because Citrin, we are doing solely impact investments through equity or convertible notes. So we do not have an incubator accelerator arm. But like Stella has mentioned, we do partner with them. Um, so generally, I think there are also two types of founders who are keen in joining these sort of um, accelerators or incubators, capacity building programs. One is those who are really in the earlier stage who need some hand-holding guidance through these programs. And those are the ones who really needed it and will benefit from it. But there are also those who join just one after another for publicity purposes, for networking purposes, who might drive them away from the attention of just building their business, actual work. So then um, those usually we are a bit more aware of when we are looking into them and budget, um, um, selecting them for investments. So then, um, but also we will have to, it will also depends on the credibility of the incubator and the accelerator, the capacity builder provider, because um, based on my experience, there are some who are legit providing whatever they can to help support the companies. But there are also those who, I'll give you a three months program, but I will tie you down with these different rights in the future here and there. So those might scare away some potential investors in the long run. So I guess, um, 
but those are also more typical incubator accelerators. So I believe the impact sector won't do such a things to our social enterprises, which is um, uh, which is good in that sense. So then, um, I think what Seth is doing, what um, Trust Fund is doing, also, I think it's all along the good side too. So yeah. Thank you for that. That's an interesting um, observation as well. Well, um, I mean, this is where I'm just going to give a plug for today's 5 p.m. session. It's actually on capacity building um, and in what capacity builders are doing now to even pivot to help social enterprises then. So we've got one from the Philippines, uh, Indonesia. Uh, Wayne will be on there from TV and Seth. Uh, so I think it'll be a really, really great discussion. Um, for those people wanting to learn more and even for the investors to hear, okay, what do these programs do? What do they focus on? Uh, so please dial in for that one. Um, I just want to touch on two very quick questions that came from yesterday and then I'm going to uh, talk about the question that's just been posted. There was, uh, I think it was uh, Adam Ho who asked about the disability sector and is there, what funding is there from uh, uh, impact investment on that? Um, Ted has actually volunteered to have a half an hour call for you, uh, with you. So I'm going to put you in touch later on today. Um, Fifi uh, from yesterday asked, Ted, how do you raise the risk appetite with your investors? And I believe what you said before was really to manage expectations. Um, would you want to add anything more to that, Ted, very quickly? No, I don't. I, you, I, that is exactly what it is. It, it is all about meet, setting expectations and then meeting expectations. I think this also speaks to Alex's point around walking that fine line between being very generous, but also tough love, right? So we need to set expectations with our investors and we need to also set expectations with the social enterprises. And those need to be fair and empathetic expectations. And then people need to be held accountable to them. Otherwise, this is all a charade and we might as well call it what it is, which is gambling with money, right? So expectations are key. Great. Ashley, uh, Jen, can I ask you this? And uh, okay, you don't have to answer it, but I was just intrigued because you come from a family office. How did you convince your family um, and the people in the organization to actually um, go into impact investing? Wow. <laughs> um, I guess it's uh, sharing a bit of the negative side as well is that I might have some discrimination against my age. I'm kind of young. But also the um, the background. I come from a rather wealthy uh, family. But um, I guess the convincing part is that I always give them reassurance in terms of their progress, the tiny milestones that are achieved along the way. Because in, in in even in Malaysia as well, this is relatively new. Not a lot of people know about it. They don't even know what are social enterprises. They don't know what is impact investors. So generally, I just constantly throw myself out explaining what it is, um, what I think the, the future is like through this to the impact sense and um, basically just share my beliefs in impact investment to them. And then um, because they're family also, so they, I suppose they are more understanding and they are more supportive to myself. But um even outside families, uh, then I'll try to slowly, I'm not sure influence is a good word, but to attract more capital into the impact space because um, capital is lacking. There's just so much capital uh, out there and how do we best utilize it to both achieve um, uh, returns as well as impact. So that's how I generally go around it. I just talk a lot. <laughs> I love that because I think there'll be actually people in your position. Um, so, you know, the second, third generation that are coming up and they, you know, they, they've seen this world of impact, but um, I guess it's convincing. I mean, just like state, the stakeholders really uh, for Ted, um, for everybody else, we have the people who are investors, but um, even though it's a completely different dynamic where it's your family uh, and how do you kind of have those conversations uh, to kind of bridge that gap to see both sides as well and um, and to allow, yeah, to allow the company, the family um, to do this. I think it's actually amazing. And I, and I wanted to just take that gem out. So to encourage those who are listening uh, and in that position, um, yeah, just to hear your side of the story. Yeah. So um, on that, I'm going to dive into the question by Sin Kang Han. Hello. Uh, may I know what is the maximum amount a social enterprise investors should take in a business that will not cripple the potential 
of the business, allowing for creativity and innovation by the founders of the business. Um, while you're thinking about your answer on that one, I remember reading about uh, James Dyson, uh, you know, Dyson, he has no shareholders. And one of the reasons is because he wants to keep innovating and he can he can make the decision. If he wants to spend six months making a hairdryer, he can. And look what we have now, an amazing Dyson hairdryer. So I like mm -hmm. that this question is kind of like on that, is that how how is it that we can still allow for the creativity and innovation by the founders? So does anyone have insights on that? Uh, Jen? Okay. <laughs> um, um, I would imagine because we invest in the earliest stage of the enterprises, so I don't think that's quite an issue for us. But um, as usual, when we invest in it, there will be a lot of terms and conditions, whether we have a board seat or not. Uh, there's a lot of technical bits to it. So then that's where the um, founders of business will have to be aware as well. Make sure that um, your rights is preserved and um, you know what your rights are as a founder yourself and investors as well. Um, we try our best to make the agreements investment friendly too. So then um, creativity, I think it can be as innovative as the enterprises want it to be because I do believe that at the very core of it, it's the mission that matters a lot. It's the impact that they're trying to drive. So even if it's um, they're pivoting their business model in one way or another to achieve the same impact goals that they're aiming for, I think we can relax a bit more on that aspect, um, provided that everything is still on track. Yeah, so I don't think... Also, you, we generally do not invest more than X amount of percentage in the company because we want the founders to have um, ownership and um, control. What we can value at is really the guidance and the additional support, financial and non-financial, but the creativity, innovativeness, because if they are social entrepreneurs, they know the problem best. They know that the solution that they're providing from A to Z. So then if we are investing in them, I think it's best for us to believe in what they know. Yeah, yeah love that. Uh, Ted, I saw you unmute before. Did you want to say something? Uh, yes, you know, I, I believe that debt is the best vehicle to use when making impact investments. And I urge anyone who's considering an equity investment to ask themselves just how big the opportunities are for an exit. Will there be an IPO? Will this business be acquired? Will this business generate sufficient dividends that uh, the investor can be repaid that way? I think for the most promising social enterprises, addressing the biggest uh, issues that we face uh, on the planet, I think the answer is overwhelmingly no. And that's why uh, both Beneficial Returns and the Trust Fund are providing loans to our borrowers. We believe that debt is far more frequently the right vehicle to invest in, and it does avoid those conflicts which can arise when there's a lack of alignment between an equity investor and the founders of a social enterprise. There are occasions where equity makes sense, but I think that they're pretty few and far between. Um, what I love about this panel is the diversity of thoughts and the different angles. I think that um, even we had a discussion, um, I think in our dry run, just about philanthropy money versus impact money and all that. And I think, and we, were, we all agreed that it's all needed. Um, so thank you for that. Um, now we have, two minutes and I just want to respect everyone's time because um, yeah you probably have stuff to go to um, I want to thank um, oh sorry there's one more question that came yesterday and I just want to let you know um, somebody asked actually two people asked is there a list of all the available funding out there um, so what we're actually doing in the background is we have one of our team members just kind of pulling together very quickly a list uh, it's by no means going to be a hundred percent that we're going to find everything but what we do know of we will put it up there um and uh email to the participants of this um of this conference sorry alex you've unmuted do you want to say something uh i guess just a little again allegory to add to ted's point i think there is a, a big notion of the unicorn you know in the in the pevc world but against that i would suggest the example of a zebra 
And a, a zebra is not something that will, that will give you the exponential return, but it just keeps trudging. It keeps creating good value. It's just solid. And in, in, that, uh, in that framework, like Ted suggests, you know, debt is, is not a bad way to invest at all. Cool, thank you for that. Um, so before, um, actually there's one really good question I wanted to talk on, and we might do it as an overtime thing for, for those people who want to stay on. Um, it's a really great question, but what I want to do right now is just um, bring up the poll, um, just to get your feedback on the session. Also ask you if you want to get into touch on any of you know the resilience program or the investors club when you click yes we will get your email and we'll get in touch um, the lunchtime session coming up it's going to be amazing it's actually a bonus session at 12 o'clock and it's actually open to the public so if you have friends who like haven't bought a ticket and they wish they did they can come to the lunchtime session it's all on our website and it's about housing so hashtag stay home catalyzing affordable housing through shelter enterprises in Asia. Uh, we have someone from Habitat for Humanity, uh, EcoStep uh, Impact Investor, Mason Tan from um, Garden Impact. Um, and it's gonna be a really great session. I mean, in a time now where every government is telling um, its citizens to stay at home, uh, what about those who don't have a home uh, and who are struggling out there? So I think this would be a really, it's, it's such a timely discussion as well. So please join us at 12 o'clock. Uh, Social Enterprise Saturday, we've spoken about it before. Come and join us here from the Social Entrepreneurs on Saturday. Um, the numbers of the social enterprises are growing, so it's great. Um, so you have a variety of people to hear from um, and get in contact with us. So TVN um, on the website, um, we just wanna keep staying. I think out of every conference you go to or any event, I think most of the amazing stuff actually comes after the conference. Um, just before, I'm gonna make this public, Ted, what you said earlier in the dry run. Ted said to Alex, I'm gonna be really disappointed if we don't find a way to work with each other in the future. I'm putting it out there. And I think that's what is amazing about conferences. I know probably everyone's webinar out and over conference, but it's these kind of things that come out, new relationships and new collaborations. That's the really exciting part. And we also wanna hear stories. If you actually have started something or um, you know, worked with someone, um, one of the panelists um, after the conference, please write to us. We want to hear the good news stories and we want to put it out there. Um, so on that, I just want to raise this question because I think it's a really great one. It came from Mara yesterday. So for all these people who have to log off, I totally understand. But I really feel like we just need to get this one last in and then um, we can uh, all head off. So Mara yesterday said, how does an impact investor look at business fundamentals and financial returns of potential investees? compared to traditional investors. I think we've kind of touched on that before um, with the impact metrics and all that. But then it goes on to say, if a social enterprise has sound business fundamentals and financial returns uh, and can attract traditional investors, what is the distinct role of impact investors? Just putting it out there. Jen, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, um, you it, so I'm taking that as you, you, want to, you want to talk. Oh, it's okay. I just forgot to unmute it, but it's okay. I can still answer the question. <laughs> so um, I guess for us, we look at them the same way, except that, um, again, we have impact embedded along the way um, within our processes um, from selection to um, capacity building. I don't think that's a trade-off particularly because different types of investors bring in different types of values to the table. Equity investors, um, for us, even uh, after we put in money, we do hold their hands in one way or another to continue to support them to grow because that's where exit um, uh, opportunity arises as well. So um, also, I'm usually for core investments with other investors too. So um, especially given our ticket size is not huge, um, so then this gives me extra confidence that the business fundamentals and the financials are exactly where we think it is because impact investors as well as typical investors investing into one um, company. So then um, I guess in addition to the typical publicity networking opportunity strategic guidance that typical investors um, will be able to contribute, um, impact investors on top of that will also be able to highlight the impact aspects of things, um, given it's legit, 
none of those dodgy um, impaired brainwashing thing. But um, I guess because in Malaysia as well, I can only speak for Malaysia because that's where my focus area is, is that our governments have differentiated between social enterprises and typical enterprises, unlike countries like, say, Singapore, who do not differentiate them in that sense, in the legal structure sense, the benefit sense. So then, um, if we go in, then we will provide, um, uh, we will get expo get our investors, investors company exposed to these different sets of resources that is provided by the government in Malaysia, um, as well as, um, as opposed to a typical enterprises who are only allocated a set amount of resources out there, but now they're exposed to a full range um, tailored for typical enterprises as well as social enterprises because that's just how the ecosystem in Malaysia is. can't speak for other countries, but um, that's how I see our um, extra bit of value addition there. Yeah. Thank you for that. Stella? Uh, I'll try to answer this from the lens of a social entrepreneur because at YCAP, we do run the impact investment, but we also run sort of like our own social enterprise. Uh, and if you're talking about equity investment, um, I mean, as a social entrepreneur, I would want to have equity investors that understands what I'm running and what I'm trying to achieve. So that is probably the biggest difference between, um, you know, your typical traditional investors versus like if I were to get myself uh, invested by an impact investor. Um, it can be a discussion about how, sh how should I measure my impact which is still like a big question within the impact investing uh, world, or how should I look at, you know, as a social entrepreneur, you are always between that, you know, should I look for growth now or deepening the impact? Uh, ideally it would go together, but sometimes you need to make that business decision and having, you know, investors that understand that would really be helpful. But obviously if I'm an entrepreneur and the available money is a tradition, Additional investor, and that would help me grow my business at this point of time. And I have sound business fundamentals and I know how to run my business, obviously. But that's really where I see the value of an impact investor. Great, thank you. Ted, over to you. Yeah, it is my personal dream that we reach the point where social entrepreneurs can borrow freely from conventional lenders and find all the capital that they need to grow and do what they're doing. But I think we're very, very far away from that day. And it's not just because of the often added risk of a, of a social enterprise, but it's also from the fact that uh, investors are fundamentally lazy. And if you are looking to earn a return, um, why would you ever invest all the effort and time to understand a strange social enterprise operating in a challenging geography, serving uh, a poor audience, as an example. It's much easier to make a loan to a gas and oil company or to a grocery store chain or to a dentist. And so I think that um, this work is in, in requires more effort uh, for the financial reward uh, that's associated with it. Uh, but we would never crowd out conventional investors. Our dream is to get the social entre entrepreneurs to the point where they can attract conventional financing. Uh, somebody needs to, it's just like um, a child, right? If your goal is to um, have your child get a job, well, you can't have that expectation when they're an infant. You can't have that expectation when they're a toddler. You can't have their, that expectation when they're 12, right? You need to give them the support to reach the point where they can survive. And that's what we're trying to do with the still very nascent world of social enterprise. Great, thank you. Well, I think um, I might just leave a thought, and I know I'm I'm oh, I think I'm very optimistic, and um, and but I like to believe it that it, it is possible one day that actually terms like social enterprise and impact investing will just be known as enterprise and investing. Um, I know we're really, really far off, so I'm also a realist. But imagine the day where you know people will only put their money where it's good for the planet, it's good for people, it helps people, 
rather than just purely for financial return. I know that um, uh, Alex spoke about it yesterday as well, just where you put your, your treasure, your money, that's where your heart will also follow. Um, even in the world of social enterprises, you know, the time where enterprises will actually not just, you know, we talk about double bot bottom line, triple bottom line, but it will be a necessity and that we don't need this term anymore because all enterprise exists for people, uh, for the good of people, the good of the planet. Um, so I guess I just wanted to end that thought. I know it's very, very, very optimistic and maybe unrealistic at this stage, but I think we have to have a hope for me that I have this hope that we will hopefully get closer and closer and closer to that statement. And then we don't have to try and explain impact investing. We don't have to try and explain social enterprises because it's a big word. I mean, before I got into this area, uh, I was an accountant uh, for 10 years um, at a big four and then I went into mining. Yes, I worked in a mining company for a while, not with the high biz, but you know, I was in the office. Um, but I like coming from that, that world and then trying to get all this terminology and understanding, if it was just pure investment and just pure uh, enterprise. Um, yeah, it's something that we can all look forward to. So I just wanted to maybe end on that note. Um, and thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. Um, it was a great deep dive. Thank you for all the insights, even the differing views and, um, and the perspectives. Um, if I, I think I saw a lot of people enjoyed the session. So um, I guess feedback would be great. Um, if there's a particular point that we didn't get to and you wanna um, hear more, I would love to get this panel again together um, another time and um, just keep the conversations going because I think I've, I personally have learned so much uh, in the last hour. So thank you. Have a really, really great day ahead and we'll see you at 12 o'clock uh, to talk all about shelter for those who do not have um, a home to go to. So thank you and take care. Um, and thank you to the panelists again. You guys are absolutely amazing and thank you for your time. Take care.